There is no substitute for the preaching and teaching of God's Word. Each weekday on Enjoying the Journey, Scott Pauley leads us in a brief study of Scripture. Today, on the Weekend Pulpit, we are happy to share a full-length Bible message given through Scott's pulpit ministry. These messages were recorded live in a local church or gospel event in recent days. It is our prayer that the message will be a help to you today. in college work for almost 20 years in Knoxville and Tammy and I have two daughters off at college and uh, I understand for these students how meaningful it is to have a church family when you're away from home and honestly I can't think of a church that has any greater spirit uh, that students could be in than this church and I have enjoyed being here with you today I've really enjoyed the time of your pastor and his family what a precious pastor and pastor's wife even the children are pretty good that's good isn't it uh, but I thank the Lord for them, and I thank God for the church family that the Lord has allowed you to have, and to see you back on this Sunday evening in such great numbers. I'm happy to be in a church that still believes all day Sunday is the Lord's day, and uh, I'm very grateful to see you here tonight to study the Word of God, and we're going to have a good time these three nights. I hope you'll work hard at it. I know what tomorrow is. I know what tomorrow is. What is tomorrow? Monday. That's right. And I understand what Mondays can be like and school and work and all of that. But I hope you'll make a, every effort these next two nights uh, to be with us. And uh, come praying, come expecting, come reading Second Corinthians 10 before you get here. And let's just see what the Lord has for us. I want you to open the Word of God with me again to this great chapter in your New Testament, Second Corinthians chapter 10. And we began with the opening two verses this morning, and I'll read them again to you and then We'll carry on into this passage. We're coming to an interesting section of Scripture. Oh, may the Holy Spirit be our teacher now. 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse number 1. Now I, Paul, myself, beseech you by the meekness and gentleness of Christ. Stop there just a second. The main character of all Scripture is the Lord Jesus Christ. It's not Paul. It's Christ. Somebody said, I'd like to be more like Paul. I, let's, let's go better than that. I'd like to be more like Jesus. Oh, Lord, make me more like Jesus. And what does that mean? That means there must be more meekness and more gentleness. It means there must be more yieldedness to God, and it means that that must then affect every relationship, every reaction, every response. It touches every area of your life. Oh, the meekness and gentleness of Christ. You want to talk about the perfect gentleman. This is the perfect gentleman right here. He's the gentle one. He is the lovely son of God. He's not 50% man and 50% God. He's 100% man, 100% God. And the perfection of both, I'll remind you. And the God-man reveals what every follower of Jesus ought to be like. I'm thinking now of that psalm, Psalm 18, where the psalmist said, Thy gentleness hath made me great. Now, I just tell you something. If there's any great thing in your life, it's because Jesus has been gentle with you. That's opposite of the way the world thinks. The world says you're going to be great and you've got to be tough. You've got to be the man. No, he's got to be God. It's not about what you can do. It's about what God can do. It is the gentleness of our Lord. So, Paul says, I beseech you by the meekness and gentleness of Christ, who in presence and base among you, but being absent and bold towards you. That's fascinating to me. Paul said, I know, I know when I'm there, I'm not much to look at, not much to listen to. Can you imagine the Apostle Paul saying that? I mean, when I think about Paul, I think if there was a preacher I could go here outside Jesus, I'd like to hear Paul. Let's take a, let's take a survey. How many of you would like to hear Paul preach? 
But yet Paul says of himself. Matter of fact, look over at verse number 10. His letters say they are weighty and powerful, but his bodily presence is weak and his speech contemptible. Can you imagine saying that about the apostle Paul? And not only did they say it about him, he said it about himself. He said, basically, let me just put it down where you live. He said, I know I'm not much to look at, and I know I'm not much to listen to, but I have a great Savior. May I say to you, it is never about the messenger. It is about the one he represents. It's not the preacher's voice. No, no, it's the word. Paul said, this is not about me. I, I'm beseeching you by the meekness and gentleness of Christ. Look at verse 2. But I beseech you that I may not be bold when I'm present with that confidence wherewith I think to be bold against some which think of us as if we walked according to the flesh. He says, now look, when I finally show up there and see you again, I don't want to have to have it out with you face to face. Let's get this straightened up. Let's get this right between you and the Lord. Let's get this right between you and me before I ever get there. That's powerful to me. Look, let's not wait. Let's not wait till we have to see the Lord face to face someday to get some things straight. No, let's, let's take care of all that right now. Let's not wait till later. And then at the end of verse number two, he makes a little bridge here. He said, some of you think that we walk according to the flesh. In other words, you think that I operate like everybody else operates. You think I'm one of those guys that just wants to talk over you and pull yourself up by your bootstraps and I'm going to make it happen and get it done? And he says, I want you to know that's not the way I live my life and that's not the way I want you to live your life. And he goes on in verse 3, For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war after the flesh. And then we come to a verse that has captured me. It is, if I might say, one of God's powerful parentheses. How many of you are glad even the parentheses are inspired? Look at God's powerful parentheses in verse 4. Matter of fact, let's just read the verse out loud together. Ready? Here we go. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. That's good. Let's read it again. Ready? Here we go. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. I want to speak to you tonight on this subject. This is war. This is war. Say that with me, would you please, church? This is war. No, no, I want you to say it like you mean it. Ready? Here we go. This is war. Tell that sinner next to you. Turn and tell the person next to you what I'm preaching on tonight. Ready? I've heard people in nursing homes do better. Let's try it. On the count of three, I want you to preach it. Get your preaching finger out. Everybody's got a preaching finger. Now, point at the sinner next to you. And on the count of three, I want you to say it. One, two, three. Yeah. And by the way, it's not war with that person you're preaching at right now. Too many churches like that, fussing, fighting, and feuding among themselves. Somebody said some churches are more like goat pens than sheepfolds because everybody's always butting heads all the time. It ought not be that way, my friends. No, no. It's like the old uh, military general that showed up on the front lines and two of his uh, captains under him were, were leading units supposedly against the enemy. And when the general showed up, they were bickering among themselves. I mean, they were in each other's face, screaming and shouting and arguing over how they were going to advance. And he took both of them, took both of their arms and pointed them out in that direction. And he said, gentlemen, yonder is the enemy. Might I say to you, I think some of God's people need that message. Oh, no, we're not, we're not fussing among ourselves. God deliver us from that. Yonder is the enemy. And I say to you tonight, this is war. The greatest battle on earth is not trending on social media tonight. It is not being discussed on the 24-7 ad nauseum news cycle. In fact, very few people are even aware it's going on. Nobody's talking about troop advancement. Nobody's talking about casualties and deaths. Not in this war. And yet I say to you, the greatest war is never physical. It is always spiritual. I'm not trying to be spooky or mystical tonight, but I'm just telling you like it is. As surely as there is a world that you see, there is a world you cannot see. And as surely as there are physical and material and tangible and temporal things going on, there are also spiritual and eternal battles being fought at this very moment. And the cost is greater than you could ever imagine. Let me go a step further. The greatest war is never the one around you. It is the one going on inside of you. 
The biggest burdens in this room are the ones that are not on the prayer list. They never make it to the prayer list. The biggest battles in this room, they're the ones that nobody stands at the pulpit and says, pray for so-and-so, they're struggling with whatever, because the greatest battles are the ones you don't really talk about. They're the ones you fight sometimes alone in your inner man. They're the ones that keep you awake at night. They're the ones that cause you to wet your pillow with your tears and wonder how it's going to turn out. I say to you again, friends, this is war. When you come to 2 Corinthians chapter number 10, do you see the irony as he moves from the meekness and gentleness of Christ to all this spiritual warfare conversation? And we'll go further into the chapter tomorrow night, but I want to begin tonight with these two little verses, verse 3 and verse 4, and I want you to mark three words in your Bible tonight. And if you get nothing else, get these three great Bible words, and you'll remember the truth of this night. And before I show you what they are, would you look at me in the eye just for a second? Let me tell you something I'm learning about revival, because look, week after week, I'm in meetings that are called revivals. Now, whether they really are or not, only God knows, and I think sometimes we call things uh, what we want them to be, but that doesn't necessarily mean it actually comes. Let me tell you something God is teaching me about revival. When real revival comes, there is always spiritual warfare in the middle of it. Do you honestly think the devil likes what happened here this morning? I mean, look, you got you got two people who come to faith in Christ. They're not going to go to hell. That's pretty exciting, isn't it? They've come into the family of God. Don't you know the devil hates that? Everything God ordains, Satan opposes. And when the Lord is advancing, Satan is always fighting against it. I'm looking at this congregation tonight. I'm listening to all that's going on in your church. These are amazing days. I mean, the Lord, the Lord is building his church in this place. Aren't you excited to be a part of that? But I want to remind you, don't blame me, ask Nehemiah. Every time you're building, you're also battling. You may have a trial in one hand. You better keep the sword in the other hand because the enemy is always looking for some way to come against what God is doing. It's not about you. And it's not about me. Look, we're not that important. It's about God. You know why the devil hates you? You know why the devil hates this church and hates your family? It's not because we're that important. It's because we're that important to God. And the devil knows it's the only way he can strike at the heart of a loving God is to destroy those that God loves so much he gave his own son for. This is war. Here's the first word. Would you mark it in your Bible? In verse number 3, when I stop, you say the next word. Everybody look at verse 3. For though we, circle that word in your Bible, though we walk in the flesh. First of all, if you're going to understand what's going on, you need to see our walk. It's fascinating to me they would use the word walk. Isn't that a natural thing to walk? I mean, you get out of bed in the morning. When you finally get up the courage to roll out of the bed in the mornings, what do you do? I hope you walk. Some of you say, I crawl. <laughs> I crawl to the coffee maker. I understand. You don't get out of bed in the morning, take one step and say, well, I got that done for the day and go back to bed. I mean, there are those mornings, but you can't do that every day. What is a walk? It is the most natural expression of life. It's the routine. It's the everyday. By the way, may I tell you that this spiritual battle is being fought not inside the church house. It's being fought in your everyday walk. It's being fought in the normal and, and all that's going on around you. Don't miss this now. It's, it, look. It's not just, ah, oh, that happened. No, no, there's something behind that. There's something above that. There's something beyond that. There is a spiritual conflict going on between light and darkness in the everyday walk that we live in. And why is that? Well, look at the verse and you'll find out. He says, we walk, mark this phrase, in the flesh. That's, that's the reality. You want to know what our real problem is? My flesh. You know, people have the idea that pastors... Pastor, just kind of jump out of bed every morning. Can't wait to read the Bible and pray and just tell people about Jesus. May I just let you in on a little secret? Nothing could be further from the truth. Now, maybe your pastor's different. But let me just speak for me. I can't speak for him, but I can speak for me. Look, I, there are mornings I wake up and I don't even feel saved. No, no. There's mornings I wake up and I don't even feel alive, much less saved. Here's what I've discovered. Do you know the great battle I have every day is with my own wicked flesh. 
You know the danger in being saved a long time? The danger in being saved a long time is after a while, you sell yourself the lie that your flesh is getting better. And I'm going to tell you what I've discovered. It never gets better. No, no, the old man, it never gets better. That, that old Adam inside of you, that old nature, it never gets better. Beware, beware. You can't trust it. Oh, it gets very religious too. But religious flesh is still just flesh. That which is born of the flesh is flesh. That which is born of the spirit is spirit. Flesh never becomes spirit, and spirit never becomes flesh. And look, they that are in the flesh cannot please God. And the great battle in our present dilemma, the great circumstance every one of us are in is that we're still living, you ready for this, in sinful bodies surrounded by other sinners on a sin-cursed planet. That sounds very encouraging, doesn't it? It means if you're alive, everybody take a deep breath. Isn't that nice? Go ahead. Let's take another one. All right, all together. You know what that is? God's gift to you. You're alive. But watch this. If you're alive and you're still living in this body that has not yet been redeemed, the body that has not yet been transformed, the body that has not been made yet like unto the Son of God, then you know what your biggest battle is every day? You've got to battle you. That's why old Lester Roloff used to say the first thing he did every morning when he got up was jump in the grave. Not jump in the shower, jump in the grave. Why would he say such a thing? Because watch this, please. If you don't start every day dead to self, you'll never live to Christ. If early every day you don't understand, look, you can't take a single step without Jesus, you will never live in victory. Jesus said, without me, you can do nothing. Not a little bit. He said, you can do nothing, which means, look, I can't even walk the way I'm supposed to walk. I can't live the way I'm supposed to live. I can't be the man I'm supposed to be unless some divine power comes over me in my daily walk. Go back to Romans 7 with me just for a second, real quick. Just run back with me to Romans chapter 7. Let me show you what I'm talking about. The apostle Paul, I think, is the greatest Christian that ever lived. And look at what he said about himself. Look at Romans 7, verse 18. And Paul said this. You better believe we all have to say this. For I know. What do you know, Paul? Romans 7, verse 18. For I know that in me, and then here's another one of God's powerful parentheses, that is in my flesh, sound familiar, dwelleth, what's it say, church? And not a little bit, but what? Nothing. No good thing. For to will is present with me, but how to perform that which is good I find not. Any of you ever have this dilemma like you really want to do the right thing, but you just can't figure out exactly how you're going to get it done? And then there's a sin. You really don't want to do it, then what do you keep doing? You keep doing the same stupid thing over and over again. You think you're the only one too, don't you? Really? Keep reading. Look at verse 19. For the good that I would, I do not, but the evil which I would not, that I do. Now, if I do that I would not, it is no more I that do it, but sin that dwelleth in me. Somebody says, that sounds confusing. Yes, sin is very confusing. We're all mixed up because of our flesh. Come to chapter 8. Look at verse number 1. There is therefore... Now, remember God's present tense now we saw earlier today? Here's another now. Now, no condemnation of them which are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but mark this in your Bible, after the Spirit. Oh, this is powerful. You can't change your old nature, but you can choose which nature you yield to. Listen to me, church. You are living in the flesh, but you don't have to live after the flesh. You're living in a sinful body. You're living in a sinful world. You're living surrounded by other sinners. But you don't have to chase after sin. You can choose to say, no, no. In my daily walk, I choose to yield to Christ. I'm going to walk after the Spirit. Keep reading. Come down to verse number 4 of Romans 8. That the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk not, notice, after the flesh, but after the Spirit. For they that are after the flesh do mind the things of the flesh. But they that are after the Spirit, the things of the Spirit. For to be carnally minded is death. Remember that. We're coming back to that thought, the mind. To be fleshly, carnally minded is death. But to be spiritually minded is life and peace. Because the carnal mind is enmity against God. It's not subject to the law of God. Neither indeed can be. So then they that are in the flesh cannot please God. You might be living in this body. But you don't have to follow after what the body tells you to do. Why? Because Jesus set you free. And the Holy Ghost lives inside of you now. My grandpa was an old-timey mountain preacher in the hills of West Virginia. He used to say, 
and that it's like two big old bulldogs living inside of you. And whichever one you feed the most and say sick them to, that's the one that wins. That's exactly right. You have the old man and you have the new man, and they're always vying for the big place, you know, for, for the main place in your life. And every day in your daily walk, you must choose by the grace of God who you're going to yield to. So this is war. It begins in our walk. Go back with me to 2 Corinthians 10 now and mark the second word. The Bible says, when I stop, say the next word again, please, church. Romans, 2 Corinthians 10, verse 3. For though we walk in the flesh, we do not. Now circle that word in your Bible. So you've got walk. That's the daily life that we live. But now you have the war. Life is not just a leisurely walk. It's a literal war. And here's the great issue. Who's the enemy? Possible that somebody in this room is fighting God right now. That's right. And if you don't believe me, read your New Testament carefully. The Bible says that's a war you can't win. A little over five years ago, God led us to step out by faith and leave where we were, where I'd been for 20-some years, and loved the place and loved the people and thought I was going to be there the rest of my life and the only place my wife and kids had ever known. And God led us to leave there and step out into evangelistic work. And somebody said, well, when God called you and you knew it was the Lord, I I'm sure you were excited about it. And I said, no. No, when I, when I finally knew what it was, I argued with the Holy Spirit. I really did. Matter of fact, I remember being in a car. I was preaching in Washington, D.C. I remember being in a car alone, just me and the Lord. I was driving down the road, and I was arguing with the Lord. I mean, like he's sitting right there in the seat next to me. I was just arguing back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. I remember that day. You know what I discovered? That's not an argument you can win. And you can fight against God if you want to, but I'm just going to tell you, you're going to be one more miserable human being doing it. The only joy is found in yielding, not in fighting. Maybe, not only are you wrongly fighting God, maybe you're failing to fight the devil. That's possible. You've given the devil some place in your life. By the way, he'll take any place you give him. Maybe you are mistakenly fighting with somebody else, another human. You're fussing and fighting and strife and division. I want you to know that's a distraction from the real battle. That's all it is. That's a minor skirmish in a major war, and you have lost sight of who the real enemy is. Would you like to know who the real enemy is? You. You know who Scott Pauley's greatest enemy is? It's the man he looks at in the mirror every morning. You'd like to think you could move away. The problem is you take you with you. You'd like to think, well, I'll get out of that circumstance. You might get out of that circumstance, but when you get out of that circumstance, let me tell you what you still have. You still have you. And the great war in life is not primarily just the devil. Satan is God's enemy, there's no doubt. But I'm going to tell you who my greatest enemy is. It's my own sinful, weak, wicked, rotten flesh. That's all it is. And I want to say to every believer in this room tonight, you better get clear who it is you're fighting, who it is you have to deal with, because until you identify that, until you let the Lord show you you, you will never live in victory. You know the funny thing about studying the Bible? When you study the Bible, you not only get to know God better, you get to know you better. And that's not always a pleasant thing either. In fact, everybody wants a revival meeting where everybody just feels good. Would you like to just feel good? You know that warm, fuzzy feeling. And everybody says, well, that was such a nice meeting. Well, we can have that kind of meeting if you want to. But I'm going to tell you, in a real revival, here's what God does. God turns the searchlight of the Spirit and the Scriptures on you. You pass through His x-ray machine. By the way, it shows up everything. And then God starts taking his scalpel and cutting things out. And you say, ouch, that hurts, Lord. And the Lord says, wait a minute, you said you wanted me to be thorough with you. And where must the real battle be waged in us? As a matter of fact, in the context of 2 Corinthians chapter 10, this is interesting to me. Do you know who the Corinth, Corinthian Christians thought their enemy was? Paul. <laughs> How crazy is that? They actually thought... That the Holy Spirit-inspired apostle was their enemy, and they were fighting back against him. I'm convinced that the devil distracts so many good Christians today with the wrong battle that they miss the main war that's going on. Paul wrote another place to the church at Galatians. Am I your enemy because I tell you the truth? Let me just pause and say this. You have a faithful Bible preacher in this place. Now, I can tell that by the way you hear preaching. You tell a lot about a church when you come in. 
don't know anybody and just get up and preach the Bible. And I can tell you're used to being fed the Word of God and getting the Bible. And I love that. I think it's wonderful. And you ought to praise God for the faithful messenger the Lord has given you. Look, evangelists just, they blow through town. They come alongside a pastor to try to encourage a church. But I thank God for the faithful shepherds who give you the Word of God. But I'm going to tell you something tonight. That man's not your enemy. If you think for a minute that somebody who's trying to point you to Jesus and love you nearer to God and pray you into all of the will of God is the enemy, then the devil has sold you a bill of goods. Look, you want to see the enemy? Look in the mirror and see yourself. We must not only identify who the enemy is, but where the battle is waged. Look, please, what the Bible says in verse number 4. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God are the pulling down of strongholds. Well, where are the strongholds? Keep reading. Look at verse 5. Casting down imaginations. Mark that word imaginations in your Bible, would you please? We'll come back to this verse tomorrow night. Let's just stop here for now. It's in your thought life. Remember I said to you a little while ago, remember that verse in Romans, to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. I'm going to tell you why that is. Because the great battlefield of life is the mind. Every battle that is lost in a marriage was lost first in a thought life. Every war that breaks out in a family started with a seed thought. Every conflict a church ever faces started somewhere with a little seed, a thought that was placed in somebody's mind, and we nursed it along. And if you don't deal with the thought, then you can never deal with the sin. If you're not willing to let God lay you out and show you yourself and be thorough with that and deal with that, then you can never have God's victory. Never. And I think it's interesting you would use the word imaginations here. The thought processes, the the reasoning, the speculation, the the way we go through things. Anybody remember way back in the book of Genesis, chapter number 6, when God saw in Noah's day that the wickedness was great and the what? The imaginations of the heart was only evil continually. And you know what's really scary? Wicked imaginations can dress up for church. Did you know wicked imaginations can preach a sermon? Oh, yes, it can. It can sing a song. It can testify. It can pass out a gospel track. It can go through all of the motions because, watch please, the war is not external. The war is internal. And if it is going to be won, it must be waged in the thought life. So pray tell me, how do you win against imagination? Somebody said, my imagination preacher just ran wild with fear. My imagination just ran wild with lust. My, my imagination just ran wild with pride. I don't know how to deal with this imagination. I don't know how to bring this under control. I'm glad you asked. Let me show you. Go back to Matthew with me for just a second. We've been in Matthew several times today looking at Jesus' words, comparing Scripture with Scripture. Go to Matthew 22. This lawyer is asking the Lord what the greatest commandment is. You know the story. Love the Lord your God. That's the first. The second is likened to it. Love your neighbors yourself. But I want to show you something really interesting tonight. Look at Matthew 22, verse number 37. Jesus is quoting from Deuteronomy 6. And Jesus said unto him, look at it, Deuteronomy 22, 37. Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart and with all thy soul and with all thy, what's that word, church? Literally, with your imaginations, with your thoughts. You know what's really interesting about this? I said he was quoting from Deuteronomy 6. In Deuteronomy 6, he says, Love the Lord with all your heart, all the soul, and all the might. At a glance, somebody might say, Oh, I think maybe this is just a little typo. There is no typo in here, friend. This is the holy preserved word of God. Somebody say, Well, maybe Jesus just misquoted it. Let me just tell you, the perfect word with a capital W never misquoted the word. Now, in fact, this same passage where Jesus quotes this is found in Mark and in Luke. And you know in Mark and in Luke, he actually lists four in each place. All the heart, all the soul, all the might, and all of the mind. All four are listed. The heart, the soul, the strength, and the mind. All four are listed. So watch this. This is powerful. You know what Jesus did? Jesus added one to the list. Let that sink in just a minute. 
Here we are in the Old Testament, Deuteronomy 6, and God says, Love the Lord with all your heart, all your soul, and all your strength, or all your might. And the Lord Jesus comes along teaching. Watch. Don't you know that Jesus is always line upon line, precept upon precept, teaching us more and more of any more and more of God to us? Somebody says, well, how could he add to Deuteronomy? Because he's the one who wrote Deuteronomy. Only God can add to the word of God. And when our Lord Jesus came along, watch this. He said, love him with your heart. Love him with your soul. Oh, yes, love him with all your might and strength. But look here. Love him with your mind. Would you like to know how to conquer sin in you? Only love can win the war. Only love. You want to conquer the sin inside of you? You want to conquer the besetting sin in you? I'm going to tell you how. You must come to love Jesus more than you love that. When Christ is in his rightful place, Christ crowds it all out. I've met people all of my life. I've done it myself who've tried desperately in vain to get some sin, some thing out of their life by kicking and pushing and prying and trying to stop doing that and they can't win the victory that way. You know why? Because that's fleshly means. That's carnal means. No, no. You are not powerful enough to get that out of your life. But when Jesus gets big in your life, there's not room for Christ and that Christ crowds all lesser things out of your life. And the only way we can win the war is by loving Jesus. Would you, would, you like to, would you like to keep your imaginations right? I'm going to tell you what you need to do. Work on loving him in your thought life. Work on loving him in your imagination. Let me tell you what it means. It means loving him when you're not in church. It, pardon me. Let, me. let me meddle. It means loving him when you're doing the dishes and loving him when you're driving to work and loving on Jesus when you're walking through the day. Loving on Jesus when you're laying in bed at night and just lying there thinking about things. Love on Christ. Love the Lord Jesus with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength and thoughts. Look, love him with every part of your being. Let God be God and let Christ be Lord. And when Jesus is loved in the imaginations, hallelujah, he will win the war inside of you. Go back with me to 2 Corinthians and let me give you one more word quickly. We see the walk, that's our everyday life. We see the war, that's the spiritual conflict that only Christ can conquer. But now, one more, look at verse 4. For the, what's that word, church? Weapons, mark it in your Bible. So we have our walk, we have our war, and now, thank you, Jesus, we have our weapons. Anybody else glad God didn't send you to war without the weapons? And they're not your own weapons. No, no, it's the divine arsenal. What are they? Look at verse 4. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal. Do you know, Pastor, I have met so many people through the years. I'm talking about good people. I'm talking about people sitting in this room tonight, Sunday night Christians, who really do love the Lord. They really do love the Lord. But they keep living in such defeat over and over and over again. And they suddenly think, well, maybe I can never live in victory. I mean, I'm just not spiritual enough. I, I don't know what I'm going to do. And, and we pray and we cry and we commit to God and we stand up and testify again. And we say, I'm never going to do that again. Or I promise I'm going to do that. And then we don't. And after a while, we start thinking, you know, there's no victory to be had. Could it be that though your intention is good, your arsenal is wrong? So you don't live the Christian life by your own willpower. Remember, in me, that is in my flesh, dwelleth no good thing. So look at it. The weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. What's Paul saying? He's saying, I am weak, but he is strong. I am unholy, but he's holy. I'm ignorant, but he's wise. I'm incapable, but he's all sufficient. I'm nothing, but he's everything. Look, it's coming to the end of yourself. Are you there yet? Could it be that God's waiting on us to come like the psalmist to wit's end and we finally throw our hands up and say, I quit, and heaven applauds, and God says, good, I've been waiting for you to get there for a little while. Because you can't live this Christian life in your own power. You can't win this war in your own strength. You need God's weapons. You need the Lord's strength to win this battle. It reminds us not only of our own weakness, but it reminds us of his sufficiency. And we've come full circle back to where we started this Lord's Day. What's the mighty weapons? Go back to Romans 13 just for a second, would you please? One of my favorite verses. The Holy Spirit's been bringing it to my mind a lot here lately. I guess I need it. 
Look at Romans 13 and verse 14. But put ye on the Lord Jesus Christ. And make not provision for the flesh to fulfill the lust thereof. Would you like to be free of that flesh at the end of the verse? Then you must live in the beginning of the verse. Would you like to live in the victory at the end? Then you must put on the armor at the beginning. What is the armor? Look at it, please. We put on the Lord Jesus Christ. Sound vaguely familiar? Run to Jesus. See, Christ is not just what those two sinners down here needed today to be saved. Christ is not just how you came to God. Christ alone is the only way you can live in victory and power every day. I, look, I need Jesus. I needed him as a five-year-old boy when I came by faith to receive him as my Savior. But I'm going to tell you as a 44-year-old man tonight, I need Jesus more than I ever have in my life. I need Jesus right now. Anybody else in here need Jesus tonight? Your family can't be what it ought to be. This church will never be what it ought to be. Your life cannot be what it ought to be apart from putting on the Lord Jesus Christ. Go to Ephesians 6 with me real quick. You know the passage. It's the great spiritual warfare passage. And I think, frankly, sometimes we get lost in the pictures and miss the point. I've even preached this and gotten so wrapped up on, on the, the, the loins and the breastplate and the, the footing and the shield. And I look, I like all that object lesson. It helps us understand it. Well, let's get to the point. Verse 13, wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God. Look, by faith, take Jesus tonight. By faith, take the power of God. By faith, take the mighty weapons of our warfare. By faith, take the divine resources. I heard a man preach years ago. If I said his name, your pastor would know him. I don't remember his preaching. You know what I remember? I remember his praying. I never heard a man pray like that in the pulpit. I never forget we all bowed our head. Honestly, when he started praying, I opened my eyes. I thought the Lord had showed up in the place. I remember that old man. He's with Jesus now. I remember he bowed his head, and the first words out of his mouth was, Oh, God, I take the Holy Spirit in Jesus' name. I thought I never heard anybody pray like that before. The longer I live, the more I think that old man had figured something out. He was accessing what God had already promised by faith. Take unto you the whole armor of God. Keep reading. That ye may be able to withstand in the evil day and having done all to stand. Now let's mark it. Stand therefore having your loins girt about with, underline this, truth. What is Christ? Christ is truth. I need Jesus. I need the truth. And having on the breastplate of righteousness. Oh, I got no righteousness of my own. I need Jesus. I need his righteousness. Look at verse 15. Your feet shot of the preparation of the gospel of peace. I need Jesus. I need the gospel. You say, preacher, I've already been saved. You think the gospel is just for lost people? You ought to be preaching the gospel to you every day. You want to have a good Monday? Get out of bed tomorrow morning, look straight in the mirror and say, you're a dirty, rotten, hell-deserving sinner. Somebody says, well, that'll help your self-esteem. Oh, yeah, it'll help your self-esteem. And then look at yourself in the mirror and say, and Jesus died for you. And he rose from the dead for you. And he ascended for you. And he's coming for you. And he lives in you. Now get out there and live like it today. We all need the gospel. We need Jesus. Look at verse 16. Above all, taking the shield of faith. I need faith. I need Jesus. My faith may be weak, but the object of my faith never is. Wherewith you shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked. And take the helmet of salvation. I need salvation. I need Jesus. Let's pause here a minute. I used to preach this the wrong way. I used to preach that the helmet of salvation was just knowing for sure you're saved. Now, I think you ought to know for sure you're saved. Probably somebody in this room tonight dealing with doubt. I went through a season like that, terrible doubt. Let me give you some hope. You look to the Lord and realize Jesus is enough. Stop worrying about whether you, you were sorry enough or whether you said all the right things in your prayer. Listen to me. Look to Jesus and find your hope in Christ and his sufficiency alone. He, let me tell you what he does. He takes question marks and straightens them out and makes them exclamation points. I believe you need to be sure you're saved. Well, let me ask you a question. If this is getting sure you're saved, why wouldn't that be at the beginning of the list? We're almost at the end of the list. First Thessalonians answers that question. It says, take the helmet of the hope of salvation. Watch. Too many of us think only of salvation as the past tense event that happened years ago when we got saved. I want you to know that our salvation is not just past tense. It's present tense. And hallelujah, it's future tense. The Lord is coming. 
This helmet of salvation is not just thinking, I'm saved. This helmet of salvation is thinking, Jesus is coming, and this body is getting ready to be redeemed, and I'm going to receive all that God paid for at Calvary. I'm going to tell you, you start living thinking about the second coming, you'll live different. You need Jesus in your mind. Keep reading. Look at verse 17. And the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. I need the Word of God. I need Jesus. Ever dawn on you that God gave His Son and this book the same name? That's pretty powerful, isn't it? The Word of God. God's favorite way to refer to the Scriptures is the Word of God. This is the Word of the living God. And who is Jesus? He's the Word made flesh and dwelt among us. You know what I need? I just need Jesus. I'm going to tell you what God brings you to more and more. He brings you to nothing. He brings you to nothing. He lets you hit a wall. Some of you are hitting a wall. You're getting ready to. And so that's not encouraging preacher. Oh, it's wonderful. It's just wonderful. A woman came to me in Atlanta, Georgia, sometime back at the end of a meeting. and She was a fine Christian lady. She started weeping, and she said, I got a problem. I said, what's your problem? She said, I'm getting more sinful. I said, how's that? She said, something's wrong with me. She said, the last few months, she said, I've been reading my Bible more than ever. I've been praying more. I've been living in God's presence. I've been coming to church. I've been walking with the Lord. And she said, something scary is going on. She said, it's like I keep seeing more and more sin in my life. I said, congratulations. She said, what do you mean? I said, you're not getting more sinful. You're just starting to see what God saw all along. Hudson Taylor wrote home from China to his sister and said, I never knew how bad a heart I had. Because watch this, the closer you get to the light, the more of the darkness is revealed. The closer you get to Jesus, the more you see that it is your flesh that has conspired with the devil. Does Satan have a friend in you? Could it be possible that our old flesh throws in with the devil to fight against what God wants to do, his sanctifying work in our life. I tell you, my friend, you must take the weapons of Christ and you must do battle against your own flesh. Hear me now. The hardest battle you're ever going to fight is against you. Richard Sibbs was an old Puritan. I think Johnny Pope's been here to preach. I remember the day I was standing in the Knoxville airport picking Johnny Pope up, and he came off the plane. How many remember Johnny Pope? We call him the Baptist Pope. I was just with him last week. He's a great man. Always reading something. He came bounding off the plane, which Brother Pope bounds no matter what, but he came bounding down to the terminal, and he said, Oh, Scott, he said, I've been reading something on the plane. You've got to read. I said, What is it? He said, It's an old book by a Puritan named Richard Sibbs. I said, What's the title of it? He said, The Bruised Read. Does that sound familiar to anyone? I got a copy of it. I started reading it. There's so many little nuggets in that old book. One of them was this. This is probably my favorite. Sib said, oh, I love this. He said, there is more mercy in Christ than sin in us. Whew. The more I see how much sin there is in me, the more that means to me. Look at me, please. You think there's a lot of sin in you? There may be. Probably more than you even know. But I want you to know there's more mercy in Christ than sin in you. Sib said something in that book that has stayed with me. Here's what he said. He said, most Christians are easy on themselves and severe on others. He said, but those who learn the secret of victory have learned to be tender with others and severe on yourself. If we want to see God do something great, then we're going to have to stop being so hard on everybody around us and get hard on our own sin. Because this is war. If this Bible message has been used of God in your life, or we can pray for you in some definite way, please contact us at enjoyingthejourney.org. We hope you will share the message with others who may also be encouraged by it. For additional full-length Bible messages, please visit Dr. Scott Pauley's YouTube channel. Tomorrow is the Lord's Day, and we want to encourage you to be faithful to attend a Bible preaching church in your area this Sunday. Thank you for listening to The Weekend Pulpit, and don't miss Enjoying the Journey daily devotional podcast each Monday through Friday.